So our first respondent to Dr. McWilliams' presentation is Dr. Marie Hoffman. Dr. Hoffman is a clinical psychologist and psychoanalyst practicing at the Brookhaven Center for Counseling and Development in Allentown, Pennsylvania, which she and her husband of 37 years, Lowell Hoffman, founded. She is assistant clinical professor of psychology at New York University's postdoctoral program in psychotherapy and psychoanalysis. Dr. Hoffman and her husband are founders and co-directors of the Society for Exploration of Psychoanalytic Therapies and Theology at the Brookhaven Institute for Psychoanalysis and Christian Theology. She is author of Toward Mutual Recognition, Relational Psychoanalysis and the Christian Narrative, which is just a delightful, uh, a delightful, rich piece of work. Um, and it is nominated for the 2012 Gradivo Award. The title of Dr. Hoffman's response to Dr. McWilliams' paper is The Welcome Return of the Suppressed, Religion and Psychoanalysis in Dialogue. Those of you from, uh, who spent some time at the Danielson Institute last year will recognize Dr. Hoffman from a presentation she did with us via video conference that was a wonderful piece of learning for all of us. And we welcome her now in person to the conference and invite her up to present to us. Thank you, Dr. McWilliams, for such a wonderful paper to respond to, and Dr. Stavros for the opportunity to respond to Dr. McWilliams. While reflecting on my response to Dr. McWilliams' paper, I became curious about the origins of the embracing interdisciplinary ethos of the Danielson Institute. I found a 1959 newspaper article written by Priscilla Birkin where I learned about Albert and Jesse Danielson and their lived Christianity. The Danielsons embodied the social conscience of their Methodist Christian faith. Their white frame home in Wellesley Hills, Massachusetts, quote, became a mecca of Christian fellowship to all without regard for race, creed, or color, unquote. Weary visitors found there a place of solace, a wellspring of spirituality and emotional well-being. Describing the Danielsons vision, Ms. Birkin wrote, quote, true religion, they believe, lifts people to levels above the low ranges of physical appearance and satisfaction and drives them to goals beyond the prudential bounds of time and sense. They feel that religion belongs distinctively to man because he can catch the vision of the ideal and real and is willing to give his life to serve this vision by conviction of its enduring value, not merely for himself, but for humanity." Unquote. Dr. McWilliams' contribution to psychoanalysis deeply resonates with the vision of the Danielsons. Samuel Taylor Coleridge once said, quote, Christianity is not a theory or speculation, but a life. Not a philosophy of life, but a life and a living process, unquote. Such life and living process is evident in Dr. McWilliams' paper, and I'm delighted to have this privilege of response. I begin by recognizing Dr. McWilliams' stunning transparency in her paper, a reflection of her relational sensibilities. I believe this transparency is possible because of at least two factors. The first has to do with Dr. McWilliams' secure identity as a person, molded both by religious values and firmly planted in her psychoanalytic profession. For her, as for the Danielsons, these two spheres enrich each other. The second factor is the safety of this space. Openness to both religion and science is the heritage of Danielson Institute. And thankfully, in psychoanalysis today, we can speak with relative ease of our informing religious narratives and find a tolerance uh, that in years past was not possible. I wish to thank Dr. McWilliams for her candor, Dr. George Stavros, and the Danielson Institute for this welcoming forum, 
and also Dr. Merle Jordan, the John Templeton Foundation, and the Metanexus Institute, whose funding made this day possible. In my discussion of Dr. McWilliams' paper, I'll consider the role of religion in psychoanalysis. I will briefly describe its suppression in psychoanalytic history and highlight those prominent psychoanalysts who precede Dr. McWilliams in the integration of faith into their work. As I interact with Dr. McWilliams' paper, I will give a deserved recognition to the expression of her faith in the practice of psychoanalysis. The suppression of religion in psychoanalytic history, Freud and his followers. There is no lack of knowledge concerning Freud's disdain of religion, but there is a lack of consideration of his ample reasons for its dismissal. While painfully aware of centuries of anti-Semitism, Freud himself experienced ongoing prejudice promulgated by the Habsburg church-state marriage. Anti-Semitism not only limited his professional ambitions, but foisted humiliations upon him, his father, and his children. Like many Jews of his era, Enlightenment secularism became a far more attractive alternative. Although Freud noted that his beliefs regarding religion were personal, he nonetheless established a godless trajectory for psychoanalysis that his disciples followed. One exception was Freud's lifelong friend, Swiss pastor Oscar Feaster. Most psychoanalysts know of their close friendship and Feaster's response to Freud's future of an illusion. Less known are numerous other analysts who were attracted to psychoanalysis because of the embedded Judaic and Christian values that Feaster alludes to in the following remark. Quote, it is not the, it is not the religious creed that is the true criterion for a Christian. In John 13, 35, another is given. By this love you have for one another, everyone will know that you're my disciples. I dare to assert again that Freud, in the light of these words, with his view of life and his life's work, has preeminence over many a certified church Christian who considers him a heathen. Psychoanalysis influenced by Christianity. In Freud's shadow, most analysts of religious persuasion kept it a private matter. I'll briefly note these early psychoanalysts who were influenced by the Christian narrative. More thorough accounts may be found in my book, Toward Mutual Recognition, Relational Psychoanalysis and the Christian Narrative. In England, D.W. Winnicott bravely posited a place for religion in potential space. Hugh Crichton Miller, founder of Tavistock, not only sought to live out his Christian calling by helping traumatized war veterans, but wrote a book for clergy about psychoanalysis. John Rickman, a Quaker who was at the nucleus of the independent group and at Tavistock, wrote, Need for a Belief in God. Wilfred Beyond's family crest as a child was, Without God, there is no purpose. Michael Ballant, converted to a distinctively Christian Hungarian Unitarian Church, which according to Andre Henal, was a shift of religious persuasion more than one to avoid anti-Semitism. In Scotland, Ian and Jane Suddy wrote Origins of Love and Hate, a book based on their Christian ideals. Jane also translated Shandor Ferenczi's Further Contributions, Volume 2. In Edinburgh, W.R.D. Fairbairn lived a private, lifelong Christian faith, one documented in his diaries and permeating his theory of endopsychic structure. Harold Guntrip was a congregational minister who popularized Fairbairn's ideas. In the United States, psychoanalysts with ties to Christian faith include James Jackson Putnam, first president of the American Psychoanalytic Association. Clara Thompson was raised Baptist and once aspired to become a medical missionary. Harry Stack Sullivan likely enacted a revolt against his Catholic upbringing by focusing on demystification and challenging the Freudian papacy. Heinz Kohut wrote about religion and converted to a Christian expression of Unitarianism. He even requested that Martin Luther's A Mighty Fortress is Our God be played at his funeral. Eric Erickson's mother read Christian philosopher Soren Kierkegaard to him while in utero and during his childhood, <laughs> urging him to rever the existential core of Christianity. 
Karen Hornai was raised Lutheran, and her early diaries reveal a deep faith. In adulthood, though no longer observant, she was a devoted friend of theologian Paul Tillich, Tillich delivering the eulogy at her funeral. Collectively, these psychoanalysts profoundly influenced the development of psychoanalysis. However, these religious influences were hidden or suppressed by a psychoanalytic community whose bias against religion was yet potent. The expression of religion in psychoanalytic practice. In order to contextualize my remarks, I'll begin by describing my own religious tradition. I'll then explore the expression of religion in Dr. McWilliams' paper by referencing three couplets that appear in her final paragraph. Utilizing the first couplet, I will reflect on Dr. McWilliams' perspectives on human nature and their expression in her work. Using Dr. McWilliams' second couplet, I will address human experience from the vantage point of analyst and patient and consider a psychotherapy practiced with the Christian narrative as its latent compass. With the third couplet, I will enumerate and elaborate on the human attitudes exemplified by Dr. McWilliams as a psychoanalyst. My religious tradition. I was only child to immigrant parents from the Middle East. My parents migrated from the Greek Orthodox Church to Methodist, to Baptist, to Pentecostal, and then finally to independent churches. At home, Mother, father, and I daily studied the Bible and prayed for others. Our dinner table was open to anyone in need, my mother adding another plate at a moment's notice. Though my father was a harsh disciplinarian, I would awaken at night to see him on his knees in prayer, weeping for people in need. I attended a conservative Christian university where the discipline of my father prevailed, but without his passion or compassion. Together with my future husband, Lowell, we attended an off-campus church where Reverend Stuart Latimer, an academic and a man of true Christian virtue, provided a model of authentic Christianity. After four years of marriage with one child born and one on the way, Lowell and I studied at a community in Switzerland called Labrie. There, in the context of loving relationship and scholarship, we were drawn toward a relational experience of our faith, and also a career in psychology. Our religious orientation became Presbyterian, for we appreciated the doctrinal depth and the representative church governance. Like Dr. McWilliams, we have come to recognize the considerable resonance of our Christian faith with our psychoanalytic theories. We value both our secular and religious communities and appreciate them most when they propel us toward love and justice. Having presented my religious influences, I now turn to Dr. McWilliams' moving paper. Human nature. In the final paragraph of Dr. McWilliams' paper, she distills the legacy of her Protestant background. The first two influences of her Protestant upbringing form a couplet that she lists as, quote, an ethic of respect and a sense of the presence of both good and evil, especially evil, in everyone." Unquote. This couplet aptly represents both Dr. McWilliams and Christianity's perspectives on human nature and is my first focus. Dr. McWilliams writes, quote, as I consider my religious background and its effect on my work, I suspect its strongest influence has been on my overall moral sensibility. I loved Jesus' tendency to hang out with prostitutes and lowlifes. The Judeo-Christian emphasis on the dignity of every person rings true to me. The ethic of respect, the I-thou, subject-to-subject connection that I hope characterizes my clinical work derives directly from the Judeo-Christian tradition." Unquote. Supporting her stated values, Dr. McWilliams offers a panoply of experiences with patients that illuminate her view of their worth. She first describes her long treatment with a lesbian woman trapped in a heterosexual marriage. Dr. McWilliams narrates, I watched her slowly feel seen and accepted as she was. 
She then recounts the experiences of a man raised in a contemptuous secular Jewish home where the only escape had been the young man's flight to Buddhist meditation. He feared that Dr. McWilliams would, quote, assail his spiritual interests and devalue his Buddhist meditation, unquote. Like many spiritual people who grace our offices, he feared that her psychoanalysis would have no room for his spirituality. Dr. McWilliams relates, quote, he was surprised to learn that I really do not, like his parents, have contempt for faith, that my stance supporting his spiritual quest is not simply an assumed professional persona, unquote. For Dr. McWilliams, her ethic of respect is based on the intrinsic worth of each individual without regard to their unique sensibilities that may differ from hers. Dr. McWilliams' third illustration is with a young man who, quote, had the charm and manipulativeness of the psychopath, unquote. For an author of a book on psychoanalytic diagnosis who facilely recognized the character issues involved, uh, Dr. McWilliams' respect for the intrinsic worth of even this broken man allows her to work with hope. Dr. McWilliams' belief in the real presence of evil, not just of good, gives contrast and potency to her ethic of respect. This respect in the face of human brokenness she derives for her, from her embrace of the concept of grace. Quote, God loves us despite our not deserving this love, unquote. It is perhaps her belief in the presence of both good and evil in human nature that also gives Dr. McWilliams her continued resilience. In each of these situations, the ruptures of the psychoanalytic hour are anticipated as manifestations of our broken human condition. She writes, quote, it seems that I am circling back to the topic of the sin of pride and the value of recognizing the futility of human efforts to be perfect or omnipotent. The notion that we are all, in Sullivan's words, more simply human than otherwise, and as Lacan noted, we are all broken, has a deep appeal to me, unquote. I resonate with Dr. McWilliams' views on human nature and would like to contemplate the theological narrative from which I believe these views emanate. That narrative begins with humans who were created perfect and whole, reflecting their creator and worthy of all respect. Into this idyllic state, a rupture of cosmic proportions interposes between humans and God, between humans and other humans, as well as within each human being. Evil enters the world and renders humans internally and externally broken. Though the reflection of the creator would remain, it would be distorted by brokenness, perpetuated generationally through identifications with parents. This narrative asserts that the longing of the creator is for a reversal of this fractured condition, a renewal of shalom through the instrumentality of humans empowered by love. This longing echoes in the radical words that Jesus taught us to pray. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In the thick theological construct of Imago Dei, humans are made in the image of God despite damage, deprivation, or lack of capacity. All are worthy of the greatest dignity and care. No one can be deemed unfit, unworthy, unnecessary. This ethic of respect directs our sight beyond our patient's shattered state and kindles hope for a meaningful destiny, one inspired by grace and reflective of the redemptive nature of a loving God. While immersed in the pathos of Dr. McWilliams' clinical work, my mind traversed to my work with a patient whose encounter with evil was of the darkest sort. At six, Mandy's mother was murdered and mutilated by her father, who then turned his violence on her. Mandy lost her eye, and lacerations to her face and torso required over 150 stitches. Through her 20s and 30s, Mandy and I worked with the shared belief in a God who could restore beauty and meaning in spite of her catastrophic childhood. Today, Mandy, married and mother of two, is studying to help others in the very areas of her trauma. Human experience. The second couplet from Dr. McWilliams' paper is, quote, tolerance for painful emotional uh, states 
and a sense of awe, unquote. I find in these two human experiences a cause and effect that I will later ponder in the context of Winnicott's writings. But I would first like to stay experienced near and relate this couplet of understandings to what I feel is most gripping and stunning in Dr. McWilliams' presentation, her own story. Dr. McWilliams entrusts to us her personal journey, which is marked by shattering losses. The loss of mother, the loss of father in his season of mourning, the loss of Anna, her beloved African-American housekeeper, just months after losing her mother, the loss of the family home in Massachusetts and her circle of childhood friends, the loss of her second home in Connecticut, and a farewell to the lovely New England white steeple churches, the loss of the familiar congregational church, the loss of her kind-hearted stepmother or second mother, and more recently, the loss of her companion, colleague, and husband of many years, Carrie McWilliams. I'm inspired and even awed by how Dr. McWilliams relates all of her losses with no discernible tinge of bitterness, sense of injustice, or expectation of reparation. Dr. McWilliams' acceptance of the thrownness of life was surely aided by a personal appropriation of her early theologically grounded views of goodness and evil in a terribly broken world. Dr. McWilliams muses, quote, one lesson of my bereavement was the searing realization that life is capricious, that we can all die at any time, and that given the ongoing possibility of sudden loss or change, we must live as well and fully as possible in the here and now." Unquote. I suspect that there is more than a mere mental assent to the capriciousness of life. Dr. McWilliams' capacity to tolerate excruciatingly painful affect and her equanimity in sharing her story suggest a sense of surrender to something greater, greater than herself, a sense of awe at, quote, the presence of God, or whatever we call that which is unimaginably greater than ourselves, unquote. In surrender to that which is greater than herself, Dr. McWilliams becomes enabled as a psychotherapist to experience this sense of awe with her patients. She recounts, quote, when a patient makes a surprising discovery, or has survived a traumatic background with more resilience than I would have thought possible, or in the mysteriously synchronistic moments when my client and I have a similar dream or find ourselves with the same mental image, or when I witness sudden growth after a stretch of mutual frustration and deadness, I feel awe." Unquote. The human relational experiences that structure mental life much more than memorized maxims, principles, and derivations of former logic are painfully evident in Dr. McWilliams' path from bereavement to equanimity. Paul Ricoeur, French philosopher and Christian, once wrote, quote, I cannot conceive of a religious attitude that did not proceed from a feeling of absolute dependence, unquote. And is this, no, the quote continues, and is this not the essential relation of humankind to the sacred transmuted into speech, unquote. Recur links the ability to depend, that trusting surrender to a benevolent other, to the very essence of what it means to be religious. The capacity for absolute dependence on or surrender to God or fellow humans was a principal investigation of Donald Winnicott. In his paper, The Use of an Object, Winnicott details defensive processes that humans employ to control their experience of the world, such as clutching to feelings of omnipotence. In this state of omnipotence, a person cannot experience others as separate people, nor can he or she experience the joy of receiving, since dependence cannot be acknowledged. Winnicott depicts the role of the analyst as surviving without retaliation the attacks that stem from the objectifying omnipotence of the patient. Dr. McWilliams, elaborating on Winnicott, writes, quote, the 45 to 50 minute session and the other conventional boundaries of treatment provide a container in which both patient and therapist can tolerate the pain that we must process in bits and pieces in order to heal from our psychic injuries." Unquote. The bridge between mental assent to the need for surrender and its realization 
in the span of relational, is the span of relational experiences that make the tolerance of painful emotions survivable. Safe passages across this bridge facilitate possibilities for trust and even awe. Dr. McWilliams describes two experiences found in the facilitating environment of her own history and in her clinical work, which also have valency in the Christian narrative. The first is that of witnessing. Though in years past, witnessing was related to religious proselytism, the word, when reconstructed, conveys a, a most basic redemptive function, a function exemplified by Jesus with the agonized and humiliated <clears throat> Samaritan woman at the well. Dr. McWilliams, referring to her religious tradition, explains, quote, the language of my religious tradition captures this universal need for honest engagement with suffering, as in Isaiah's man of sorrows acquainted with grief, unquote. Dr. McWilliams continues, quote, much of psychotherapy, at least as I see it, is simply bearing witness. Unbearable suffering and the inability to imagine anything better require a relationship in which grief can be tolerated and hope can emerge, unquote. Dr. McWilliams' second experience is that of comforting. In the Christian narrative, the Spirit of God sent to encourage, strengthen, and guide Jesus' disciples upon his ascension was called the Comforter. Quote, when I was bereaved as a child, writes Dr. McWilliams, I was comforted not by those who tried to distract me, but by those who could bear my pain and tell me the truth, unquote. As painful affects are experienced and tolerated in the presence of another, the impulse to grasp at omnipotence begins to fade, and the acceptance of necessary comfort from another becomes less mental assent and more lived experience. In the shared suffering of painful emotional states, such as grief, mourning, powerlessness, despair, and fear, we can acknowledge our finiteness, find courage to receive, and discover a space for awe at that which is other than ourselves. Human attitude. In the final couplet, A Tilt Toward Gratitude and Compassion in the Face of Suffering, Dr. McWilliams describes attitudes that are the polar opposite of narcissism. She observes, quote, I have written about gratitude and remorse as the glue that supports and repairs relationships. And I understand narcissistic psychopathology in terms of the absence of the capacities for genuine appreciation and apology. Unquote. The de developmental achievements that contribute to the emergence of gratitude and compassion can be traced to a recognition of good as well as evil and a relinquishing of omnipotence. Gratitude, which is only possible when omnipotence and entitlement are surrendered, gently flows through Dr. McWilliams' essay. She does not expect a perfect world, a perfect colleague, or a perfect patient. Dr. McWilliams traces this sense of gratitude from her childhood in its earliest form where life was lived by the golden rule to her adult life in which she recognizes gratitude flowing from the experience of grace. Of her early life, she writes, quote, a deep sense of gratitude for the things I still had, health, intelligence, people who loved me, the memory of a good mother became a constant companion, unquote. Speaking of her current experience of gratitude, she comments, Quote, I am often possessed by gratitude. I find myself saying spontaneous prayers of thanks for my life, for my family, for friends, for bodily pleasures, for moments of joy, for natural beauty, for meaningful work, for all the people who have nurtured me. I am keenly aware that although I have worked hard to succeed as a therapist and teacher, I've had innumerable advantages of which I was no more deserving than anyone else." Unquote. The Christian narrative portrays the unmerited, unbidden seeking by a God who forgives, restores, and embraces even as persons struggle to retain their omnipotence. Surrender to this love transforms the tenaciously self-sufficient to the humbly grateful. But how does one express gratitude to God beyond mere words? Paul Ricoeur offers help with this question that is based in his study of Moss's work 
on gifting practices among tribal groups. In groups such as the Maori, the gift carries a magical power that binds the community together, a power that presses to be passed on. Recur demystifies these practices and establishes that, in fact, Maori practice points to a universal desire to pass on the gift as part of the action of gratitude. The generative power of gift to which gratitude is a response is also supported by research. In a 2006 study by Bartlett and Desteno, findings demonstrated that pro-social behavior is augmented by gratitude. Pro-social behavior subsequent to an experience eliciting gratitude was found to occur totally independent of a motivation to reciprocate. Grateful recipients of care were motivated to offer care to complete strangers who bore no relationship to the initial gift. The capacity to share in the suffering of another is developed in those who have themselves been recipients of compassion. The gift of compassion for the suffering of another is given through empathic identification. In empathic identification, the other is recognized as a separate person, unlike the defensive and narcissistic functions of projective identification that objectify the other. St. Paul describes the course of compassion as a redemptive dynamic that originates in God. He writes, quote, God comes alongside us when we go through hard times, and before you know it, he brings us alongside someone else who's going through hard times so that we can be there for that person, just as God was there for us. I understand Dr. McWilliams' gift of comfort and her pa and, uh, to her patients as an outpouring of comfort received. Her gratitude for comfort received regenerates with each expression of her gift of loving comfort. Her very sensitivities hewn during her own sufferings give rise to her empathic identifications and expressions of compassion. As she expresses her compassion, she simultaneously embodies the originary compassion of God's redemptive heart. Dr. McWilliams' personal and clinical practice of giving a grace received both reiterates and replicates the redemptive covenant of God with humankind, which was so succinctly stated by St. Paul, where sin abounded, grace abounds more. Conclusion. I have attempted in my response to Dr. McWilliams' paper to describe three broad intersections where I find psychoanalysis and the Christian narrative meet her view of human nature that includes an ethic of respect and a sense of both good and evil corresponds to the Judaic and Christian cadences of being made in the image of God, yet being broken. Her descriptions of the human experience of bearing painful emotional states and being surprised by a sense of awe spring from her acceptance of finiteness and her achievement of surrendering to that which is greater than herself. Her capacity for gratitude brings to expression her compassion for the other who, like her, knows suffering. I conclude by returning to the visionary benefactors of Danielson Institute, Albert and Jesse Danielson. They pursued a partnership with a God who longs to heal. May their example inspire us as psychotherapists to practice our faith both in places of worship and in our therapeutic relationships, providing for fellow sufferers what Dr. McWilliams identifies as a priestly function in which despair, dignity, and dreams are held in sacred trust. My hope is that we will collectively hasten the consummation of Jesus' prayer, that God's kingdom will come through us, and that through our vocation, God's benevolent will shall be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Thank you. Um, as part of our orientation process for the new training classes at the Danielson, we share some of the writings and letters of Albert and Jesse Danielson to one another. And within, those, within that correspondence, two things jump out at us every year, and that is their, their capacity for relational gratitude and remorse for broken relationship. It's relentless in the way that they communicate with each other and in, in their formation of the institute. So thank you for lifting that up. We really appreciate it. 
Okay, our second respondent. Dr. Phyllis Isabella Shepard is a womanist practical theologian, psychoanalyst, and sometime poet. She's associate professor of pastoral psychology and theology in Boston University School of Theology. She's earned certification in adult psychoanalysis at the Chicago Institute for Psychoanalysis and is engaged in teaching, research, the practice of psychoanalysis, pastoral counseling, and clinical consultation. Her research engages the intersection where the social and the intrapsychic meet. Her recently published Self, Culture, and Others in Womanist Practical Theology addresses serious lacunae in pastoral theology, psychology of religion, and psychoanalytic theory. Her continuing research interests include feminist ethics and practical theology, cultural dislocation and trauma, post-colonial theologies and spirituality, African-American psychology of religion, and contextual theologies. Prior to coming to Boston University, Dr. Shepard was associate professor of pastoral theology at North Park Theological Seminary. She is currently working on a project in womanist psychology of religion. She is a clinical consultant to us at the Danielson Institute, and we welcome her to be our respondent to Dr. McWilliams' presentation. And I'd like to thank um, your planning team for inviting me to be a respondent to Dr. McWilliams' paper. Um, I have used your work, of course, in classes, and um, it's a privilege to meet you and to hear the way you integrate um, your religious background and your psychoanalytic perspective. Thank you very much. I am not sure where my mind would have naturally taken me in thinking about the links between my religious sensibility and clinical work, but in reading Dr. McWilliams' paper and her description of her New England suburb and belonging to the First Congregational Church, I was struck by the early, smooth entrances into a family religious practice. As I read about the freedom from emphasis on religious education, the typical white steepled New England churches. Something about the imagery led me to think that this setting welcomed with little discord and ambivalence her and her family. My own memories surprised me. One of my earliest memories of religion involved my first great teacher handing back to us pictures that we had colored. Sister Marietta handed mine back to me, telling me that I had colored the picture of the baby Jesus, it was shortly before Christmas, the wrong color. Jesus, she explained, was not brown. I remember the shock I felt, especially since we had a brown Jesus at home, and the satisfaction I felt when my mother marched up to the school to have a talk with her and the principal. Another memory involved sister asking why my parents had not attended mass on a Sunday. And upon reporting this question to my mother, she replied, that is none of her damn business. <laughs> because I repeated my mother's response verbatim, <laughs> I was made to stay after school at the convent. I was both angry that my mother did not immediately rescue me and intrigued by the community life at the convent, which was such a contrast to school. They were, it seemed to me, vibrant and talkative and included me in their activities. I was there to be punished, unfairly, I thought, 
but they also gave me an early inkling of the importance of community life that continues to be important to me. Neither of my parents grew up Catholic. My mother was a free Methodist and my father Baptist. They converted shortly after they married and as converts, they were sometimes adamant about what it meant to be Catholic. It was, not it was not an infrequent occurrence to hear that the Pope had said something or the other that had significance for our lives. I distinctly recall that when I was about eight years old, the Pope said that we, Catholics, could visit Protestant churches. And I remember my great aunt and my great grandmother inviting me to the Free Methodist Church for a visit. Unlike Our Lady of Lourdes, which, was only, which had only a few black families as members, the Free Methodist Church would fill, was filled with black, brown, tan, and pink individuals who were connected by years of membership and family ties. Whereas Our Lady of Lourdes Parish was north of the Mason-Dixon line in Philadelphia and beautiful to me in its silence, candles, and the sense of the still order, the worship and ethos at the Free Methodist Church was Southern, Atlanta Southern, lively, responsive, and loud compared to the Catholic worship life. And unlike the role of the priest of my childhood parish, women at the Free Methodist Church held a decidedly different position. While it was clear that the pastor, a man, was powerful and the pulpit was completely his domain, I recognized that the women of the church made things happen. They brought to religion and the church a force not to be ignored. My great-grandmother, Hattie Booker Peterson, and my great-grandfather, Joseph Peterson, were founding members. Both were former slaves and brought to their religion and faith awareness both of the racial and gendered Southern context in which they lived. These dynamics were embedded in my family's religious experiences and gave religion a compelling but complicated place in my life. Religious experience was always understood as racial and cultural experience. Religion was a part of being about change in oneself, certainly, but more importantly, in the world where, according to my mother, God seemed absent at times. Our job was to be black and involved, confronting injustice regardless. The expectation to stand up and count, to have one's voice heard, was just part of the oxygen we breathed. I could experience deep disappointment in myself if I failed to confront any fear or anxiety about contributing my voice. I was, I was to take a deeper breath of this oxygen, commit myself more fully, and give my heart and mind over to this work as if I was finding faith for the first time again. This was all a part of how I understood what was acceptable black religious ways of being. But I also recognized, even though I did not know what to do about it, that there were also parts of this oxygen that were not life-giving, that the, that the pressure to be this kind of moral, ethical, just-seeking, good person demanded a great price. As a result, I developed an observing interest in black experience, in particular black women's experience of religion, self, culture, and embodiment. I guess my solution, given that I was not inclined to give religion up, was to begin to recognize it as a complicated facet of my experience, and as later, as a <clears throat> clinician, as in my patients' lives as well. I think Dr. McWilliams' paper provides an opportunity to engage some of these complicated features of religion and race as well. First, as is clear, as clinicians, we bring our religion, our morality, our spirituality, all of it with us. Transformed or not, it enters where we enter. But we also bring race, gender, and sexuality into the clinical room with us. Dr. McWilliams' paper is filled with the fact of her whiteness, her Christianity, her heterosexuality, and at the same time, she speaks to the privileges that the world affords her as a result. Listen to these bullet points from her paper. I thought the church was beautiful, spare, elegant, white, 
steepled, a New England house of worship. My father considered going into ministry, but decided against it because he worried about the kind of life his wife would live as the spouse of a pastor. I wanted to understand the role of men in conception. I asked why only women with husbands had babies. She replied, God would not want a child to grow up without a father. 1950s white suburbia, single mothers were invisible. My mother's death was a terrible loss. My sanity was saved by a loving African-American woman my father hired. My father paid Anna $40 a day. I made a close and continuing friendship with an African-American girl in the National Council for Christians and Jews. I met my husband at Oberlin. We married. I am often possessed by gratitude. I have had innumerable advantages of which I was no more deserving than anyone else. Obviously, I pulled these bullet points out, but they were evocative for me. I am a black lesbian clinician and practical theologian. I began to wonder what difference our differences make in the clinical room and in our scholarship. And of course, given the nature of vignettes, as opposed to full clinical material, we are working with limited material. I have found that race, gender, and sexuality is almost always a feature in my patients' concerns, dreams, and fantasies in relation to me, and in fairly undisguised form some of the time. For example, a young white woman from Germany new to seminary in the, in the United States, is referred to me by her professor. When I enter the waiting room to, re, to receive her, she looks up, she looks at me, and begins to sob. When we get to my office, I inquire about her tears, and she says, my therapist back home was perfect. She was white, small, and she speaks perfect German. This woman was longing for her former therapist during this current crisis. So this is not only about race, size, and language, but my not being white was a part of her pain in the moment. My not being thin was a part of her pain in the moment. And certainly me not greeting her with the familiar German language was a part of her pain in the moment. She was pursuing a degree in ministry and was confused, she said, by the tensions between the white women in class and the African-American women in the feminist theology class. She said, we do not have this kind of tension at home. I knew we were in for a long treatment. <laughs> a Puerto Rican woman, a lesbian, is referred to me and, and is convinced that I too am Puerto Rican and a lesbian. She is so convinced that on occasion, she would speak in Spanish to me. <laughs> she was Roman Catholic and no one, she told me, no one knows that she is a lesbian. Though her mother repeatedly invites her girlfriend to family gatherings. My patient tells me of her split life, straight at home in church, where she is very involved and in the life on the weekends. She was depressed, growing to, hate going, growing to hate going to church and to family gatherings. When it finally occurred to her, outside of the treatment space, that I was not Puerto Rican, she almost left treatment. She wondered if I was qualified to treat her. Had I had attended a good school? Was I good enough? And furthermore, was I Catholic? Another woman, after six months of treatment, an African-American woman who's a pastor in a large black church decides to stop straightening her hair and wants to wear it in a short afro. She takes this up in treatment 
She takes up in treatment her long-standing and ambivalent feelings about being black. She wants to become comfortable, she says, in her skin. How she wonders, did I do this? She goes so far as to re research me online, finds my dissertation on black women's experiences of embodiment in light of theological and psychoanalytic perspectives. The decision to cut her hair was met with surprise by members of the church, and they let her know. She began to hear subtle messages that she may not be straight. A teenager in the youth group began to make negative remarks about queer people. My patient is not a lesbian, but she is afraid. She says that people will begin to think that she is fill in the blank. She is in a self-identified black progressive church. These kinds of splits, which is the way I think about them, are operative in these patients, do not just re reside in their individual interpsychic lives. The religious contexts in which they live are also implicated in the way in which splitting one's private sexual life, feelings about race and gender, and views about sexuality, totally out of awareness, or certainly out of religious talk, occurs not only in religious communities, but it occurs in psychoanalytic treatments. As a practical theologian who is a psychoanalyst, I attempt to bring an awareness and critical reading of the ways in which institutions, communities of religious practices and their theories establish boundaries, both spoken and unspoken, and censor through the use of religious and theoretical language, symbols, imagery, and interpersonal processes to shape and dictate ide ideologies of the self that reproduce whiteness, heteronormativity, blackness, rules for gender roles, and rules and ideas about economic rightness, what it means to be middle class. When I think of what psychotherapy and religious experience could be, and at its best, I think, and at its best, I think of the poet Pat Parker, who said, if I could take all of the parts of me with me when I go somewhere and not have to say to any of them, no, you stay home tonight, you won't be welcome because I'm going to an all-white party where I can be gay but not black, or I'm going to a black poetry reading and half the poets are anti-homosexual, or thousands of situations where something of what I am cannot come with me. The day all the different parts of me can come along, we would have what I call a revolution. I hear this call, longing, and expression of revolution as powerfully theological and psychoanalytic. It conveys a theological anthropology that says that we are a good creation. One's deepest expression of self, splintered by rejection, disavowal, fear, and movements away from community, is actually oriented toward integration, authenticity, change, and possibly hope. The psychoanalyst Margaret Lawrence writes of the possibility of mutually transformative experiences of psychoanalysis mutually between those who come to us and us. She writes that love frees us to move into the world, to love and work, and that love is strongly relational, while sin is to be interpreted as separation or alienation. She describes her own work as integrating psychoanalytic wisdom with spirituality. I did not read th that particular work of hers until after my own psychoanalytic training. When I began my psychoanalytic training program in 1998, a consultant I had been working with for some years around my clinical practice said, be very careful, Phyllis, how you talk about religion up there, because they can be a little weird when it comes to religion. It was not until five years after I graduated that the same institute offered a class on culture and psychoanalysis and I was the co-teacher, to my knowledge. Um, it has not been offered since. Uh, I don't know what I did. <laughs> um, there's never been a course 
to my knowledge, offered on spirituality and psychoanalysis. Without ever having to acknowledge it, religious institutions and psychoanalytic bodies can reproduce in the area of religion, race, gender, and sexuality the very same problems that people bring to our offices, splitting, silences, and or identifying with the values and ide ideologies that actually render one invisible or silent. I've written, the, uh, written on this previously, but I will say it here. In terms of black religion and practical theology, the splits of which I speak concern our relationship to blackness, racial ideologies, gender role expectations, and sexualities. This is a challenge that has to be faced in the religious domain and the clinical setting. If we claim that black religion is important, and a little bit of reading will tell you that we do make that claim, and crucial in some way to black life, then both religious and clinical settings have to address the ways in which race, gender, and sexuality are treated as problems or the problem. This is true both in religious practices and operational theologies. I think that psychoanalysis and religion should be dialogue partners in examining the ways in which religious and psychological practices are sometimes practices of violence disguised in theological and psychological language. Dr. McWilliams thinks of psychoanalysis as a kind of religion in the sense of offering a worldview and an ethic and an ethic of honesty. And in good psychoanalytic fashion reminds us that our behavior is sometimes unconsciously motivated. Unconscious motivations ignored produce blind spots. These forces shape how and what we enact, reenact, and embody in our psychoanalytic practices and in our religious views. The same forces mediate the conscious and the conscious, unconscious, the palatable and the terrifying, the desired and the despised, the seen and the unseen by giving shape in rituals, narratives, music, prayers, and theologies, to the thoughts, emotions, actions, and words that take up residence in our psyches and our culture and find expression between the people with whom we engage and the societies in which we call ourselves members. Therefore, these dynamics are operative in and out of religious environs and directly and indirectly form and transform the practitioner, and any observer. The powerful and varied meanings of religion are just so because religion takes place in our psyches but is mirrored and re reproduced in the cultural imagination. And as such, for many African Americans, religion, I will hold, is still a defining force of the self and their understanding of what it means to be black. But it also is a defining force for what the broader culture understands what it means to be black. The complex social and cultural enactments of the intrapsychic dimension of black religious life are rarely voiced. The convergence of the religious, intrapsychic, and the cultural can be readily observed, I think, in explicit and latent forms, in various cultural representations of black religion, certainly in churches, but we only have to sit down and watch a few um, movies, very few which have black characters, but if they do, somebody is religious in a very particular and narrow way. Thank you, Tyler Perry. Personal accounts of religious experience, both published um, conversion narratives, contemporary documentaries on black religious experience. If we do search the realm of cyberspace, which I am doing, the proliferation of religious sites and devotional sites populating um, internet religion, black internet religion. Finally, in the public production of religious figures who contribute to and benefit from black from the black spirituality and industry. In other words, a wealth of publicly and situated sources 
and individual experiences are uniquely available as grounds for our looking at an original psychology of religion that offers a deeper understanding of religious experience. In her ethnography of black women's views of faith and church, Daphne Wiggins includes an example of the kind of splitting process that I'm thinking about. She quotes one woman as saying, I welcome hearing about how to deal with racism in church, but I don't want it to be a constant thing. I don't want black everything that happens to me in life in the workspace on the fact that I'm black. I guess I'm more or less accepting. It's like, okay, you're black, accept it. Things are not the same for you. They are not ever going to be the same for you. But then again, if they were the same for you, you'd be a stronger person. You'd not be a stronger person. We're black people. We're actually more survivors because of the way we've been treated. If we were treated any less or any other way, I don't think we would be as good as we are. I mean, I have no problem with going to church with someone who's white. I think that vignette, uh, that piece of the interview is filled with um, rich material for asking questions about what does it mean? What does it mean when, it, when someone comes to the conclusion psychologically and theologically that being treated a certain way makes us stronger? makes us a better person. And then concluding with, well, I have no problem with going to church with someone white. And I, I have an image of my, in my head of her saying that. I don't have a problem with it. But clearly, going to church with someone white for her means that she's going to be treated differently by that person. Wiggins' interview with um, Gail was responding to a question about the inclusion of politics and race in sermon content. But what I noticed was the psychology of religion and blackness undergirding the interviewee's response. Except that I am black, for her personally, except I am black and deal with it. And more striking, strikingly, she somehow concludes that racism not only makes black people strong, but without it, we would be less. Gail's response begs for a different view, especially in terms of how black religious content speaks of race and racism, but in terms of how the self is understood to, to develop in a racist context and how one is to feel the experience of racism. In my view, we are just beginning to take up the complexity in a new way of psychological and social meaning as it relates to religious experience and in particular black religious experience. And the, taking seriously the place of the psychological content. The question in need of exploration is, can psychoanalysis or theology or ethics hold the social cultural dimension of religious experience while simultaneously examining the psychological action between individuals, dynamics, and unconscious processes, and the social of religious experience. In other words, we need to be able to grapple with how religious experience also forms, shapes, and misshapes the self and self-experience. This is where Dr. McWilliams' papers, this is where Dr. McWilliams' paper has sent me. When she recounts her case where an African-American woman is told by her faith community that God will not give her more than she can bear, and the gay and lesbian clients trying to live up to their community's convictions regarding the necessity for celibacy, I think religion needs psychoanalysis. <laughs> Nancy's papers, paper reminds us that religious experience is multifaceted, it's complex, and realizing this should help us deepen our understanding and our desire to understand religious, religious experience in our own lives and the lives of those who seek assistance from us. My attention in this conversation with Dr. McWilliams' work has centered around our, her personal history, my personal history with religion, as well as the dynamic forces that make some aspects of religious experience material 
to be discussed and examined while making other aspects suppressed, invisible, and split off from the discourse. The intersecting dynamics of attentiveness and blindness require a, a rich lens for the analysis of gender, sexuality, and race as experiences of the self that are deeply embedded in religious context. And the question I conclude with is, how can we more fully engage the powerful impact of our own social location as clinicians in the shaping of our experience of self and religion in our clinical context? Thank you. Thank you.